So thank you for staying. <laughs> no one's more surprised than me than when people have a chance to go home, they don't take it. So it's great that you're still here. Um, yeah, no, you haven't had lunch, okay. <laughs> That's the acid test, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No people that leave off lunch are going to feel really bad. Yeah. Maybe not. I might get it myself. Anyway. Uh, th no, thanks, honestly. And, and um, just to remind you, we're on the island. Um, what I was trying to do in that first session was to big up the, the, the picture of the purpose of small groups. They don't exist for themselves. They exist for a purpose. And, and the, the primary purpose, I would suggest, is the same purpose as the church purpose, which is that we're here to be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, any, no one small group is going to do that totally for any one person, but small groups do make a vital contribution to being a disciple of Jesus. And we're going to keep thinking about uh, this, reminding ourselves that making disciples is the goal, which, which reminds me to say thank you to uh, Phil for organising this to end at 2.30 so that we can be home to watch the football um, and, and, oh, is there rugby on? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> Cricket? What's that? I don't know, sorry. Okay, uh, you can see where my affiliations lie uh, there. Uh, uh, do you have goals in rugby? No. Anyway, um, so making disciples is the goal. Um, we, we live, I don't know if you've seen this image before. Um, it's a, an image, I think it's in, in America, Arizona or somewhere where a few years ago um, there was a big problem because there was a big river and they wanted to build, uh, uh, get across the river, so they built a bridge. Um, unfortunately, by the time they had built and commissioned the bridge, the river had moved. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so they had this wonderful structure, absolutely fit for purpose, um, but unfortunately, which no longer spans the river. And if you could just live with that image for a minute, um, you can sort of see maybe how there are some points of contact between that image and the way we do church. Uh, fundamentally, the way we do church hasn't changed for 200 years, probably around at least, maybe more. Um, but the river's moved. The way that people live their lives has moved. The, the, the challenges and demands of, of, of life have moved. The culture we live in has certainly moved a lot. The possibilities and the challenges are both different. And, and, and we spend a lot of our time at church and even at small group level running a structure that no longer spans a river. It's a challenging image. Um, so change is in the air. But change, I think, should actually point us back to small groups, not away from small groups. I don't think small groups are part of the way things were that we need to ditch in order to move forward. In fact, I think we need to redig the wells of small groups. We need to rediscover what, at best, they can be about and why some of the people that first thought about the importance of small groups, chief amongst whom probably is John Wesley back in the 18th century, actually considered that they were vital to making disciples. And the um, challenge is, right. um, that Jesus lived and worked with crowds of people. He didn't seek them out, they sought him out. Uh, he lived very much within his culture, he rubbed shoulders with the high and the low and anybody and everybody, Jesus seemed to welcome them. He was very inclusive, to use some modern jargon, which I hate. But anyway, it, um, he, he was very welcoming. Uh, he had lots and lots of followers. Incidentally, he didn't seem to mind about upsetting his followers. Uh, he, he was quite willing to say some sharp things which sent s squadrons of them marching down the road in the opposite direction. Uh, and he didn't seem to follow them and say, no, no, you didn't understand. I didn't really mean you shouldn't eat my blood and drink my... Uh, you know, he, he said, okay, you don't get it. You don't have to hang around. It's your choice. Um, how many pastoral encounters would be transformed if we had that? <laughs> but within these, these mass crowds, Jesus clearly had quite a number of people who were very particularly committed, and he was clearly very trusting of them. So suddenly, out of nowhere, in Luke 10, 72 people pitch up. 
Where do they come from? But 72 people who Jesus clearly thought had got what he was about enough that he could trust them to send them out to the towns and villages where he himself was going to go to prepare the way and to announce the kingdom there. But suddenly there was this bunch of people who somehow, somewhere, had been introduced to the kind of life that I was talking about before the break and were sufficiently trusted that they could carry that life in pairs into fresh settings out there in in the villages. You know, though, that within the 72, Jesus also called 12 to himself. And Jesus invested particularly in that 12. That was his small group, if you like. Now, there are all sorts of reasons, theologically, why there were 12 and so on, which we won't go into this morning. But, but, but Jesus was, was refounding the people of God around these 12 people by investing his life into them. This was the, Jesus-bearing, the heart of the Jesus-bearing community. These were the people who would be trained by Jesus, a three-year apprenticeship, at the end of which... They knew enough in order for him to say, now you go and make other disciples. What were they going to do? They were going to do what Jesus had done with them because that's what they understood making a disciple meant. It meant living closely with somebody and learning to do what they do, to adopt their attitudes, to be willing to die. It meant all those things and suddenly they got it. Okay, that's what it means to live this life now. Incidentally, I, I can't do this exercise now because I've just blown it, but, but one exercise I do sometimes is to say to people, imagine your church was given a huge slice of money. Just imagine. With the guideline that you must spend it on developing a disciple movement that would change the world. What, what would you do? Now, when I've done this exercise without blowing it by telling you the answer. Um, uh, it's interesting ha- ha- how many different answers, you know, people, people get very creative when they realise they've got a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, they appoint lots and lots of people and they run this and they run that. And it's interesting the answers that you get. Um, very few people say, I would spend three years investing in 12 people. And yet, when Jesus wanted to start a movement that would change the world, that's pretty much what he did. He spent three years, yes, doing what messiahs do (laughs) himself, but in terms of perpetuating the movement that he started, what he did was not primarily invested on attracting the crowds, who he did seem to have a bit of take-or-leave-it attitude to, but it was investing in these 12 who he was deeply committed to. And one of the little mantras that I often trot out is the importance of investing in a few for the sake of the many. (coughs) Investing in a few for the sake of the many. That's what Jesus did. And it's notable, and we might come back to this this afternoon a little bit if we have time, that even within the twelve, there were the three. Peter, James and John. Who were given privileged access that the other nine were not as far as we know. So Peter, James and John were taken with Jesus into the room of the little dead girl who Jesus raised back to life. Only Peter, James and John were allowed to see what happens when the Lord of life encounters death. Peter, James and John were invited onto the Mount of Transfiguration. They were allowed to see what happens when Jesus prays and all heavens opened. So uh, Peter, James and John were invited into the Garden of Gethsemane to watch what it looks like when you're praying and so hard that you, you bleed. <laughs> so Peter, James and John it seemed to be... I don't know why my, my PowerPoint seems to be determined to undermine my best attempts. <laughs> so, there's a timing thing, so I'm going to have to stop in a minute and turn it off. I know what's happened. Stop there. Okay, so the point I'm making here and if it does it again, I'll have to just pause and turn it off. Um, the point I'm making here is that, that small groups are absolutely central. The kind of relationships that develop in small groups, the kind of interaction that can happen within small groups, the kind of life-on-life learning that can happen in small groups, all the things that best that happen in small groups, they are at the heart of what it means to make disciples. 
There's an African saying, isn't there? It takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a community to make a disciple. In our highly individualized Western world, where we think me and the Bible and Jesus can hack it alone, we need to repent of that. Some people today say, well, I like Jesus, but I don't like his church. Tough, they come together. Get over it. You can't have Jesus without his church. He died to form a new community of people who would bear his name and his message into the whole world. That is the church. I was talking to Trevor earlier, and he told me about a book that he'd read, the subtitle of which is, The Plural of Disciple is Church. And it's true. It's, uh, it's true. And so we need one another. We need to be in relationships. We need to be, need to be actually in kind, the kinds of relationships. We need to be in transforming friendships, transforming relationships, whatever you want to call them. We're going to call them lots of things today. But we need to be in these kind of groups. What you do as a small group leader is absolutely at the epicenter of your church's ability to make disciples. Can I affirm your role any more highly? It's not that what worship leaders do, what preachers do, what ministers do is of no value. It all counts. But without what you do as small group leaders, or the potential for what you do as small group leaders, it will never actually gain as much traction as it should. The best preaching in the world, the best worship leading in the world, the best youth work in the world. Even youth work is about making disciples. That's what we're all supposed to be doing. How do you make children, if you're a children's worker, that grow up with that definition of discipleship that I had on the screen earlier as the norm? This is what I want to grow up and be. I want to be somebody who lives out of my new identity, loves my father, following the purposes of Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, and living a transformed life in everyday life. What an ambition for a child. And if we get the children understanding it, then there's hope for the rest of us. So small group structures are really important. Really important. One of the things that I, I love to do is I love to garden. And uh, um, I'm a bad gardener, to be honest with you. Um, my grandfather was gardener to the Bishop of Winchester, I'll have you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have inherited none of his genes whatsoever. <laughs> but I like to sort of try and keep the family line going uh, a little bit. I do know enough that if you want to grow runner beans, um, you do need to erect a structure for them to climb up. If you don't, the beans will grow, but by staying on the ground, they will get eaten by slugs and <coughs> they'll rot. So the structure is there to support the life and to protect the life and make sure the life is healthy. You need structures. Your body needs a structure. Without your skeleton, your body would be rather unpleasant, actually. <laughs> but you're not your skeleton. Your life is something more than your skeleton, but your life only happens and makes sense because you have a structure that holds you up. The point I'm making is that, that, that small groups and the other parts of church life, we need to discern, is this bean or is this bean stick? Because fundamentally, bean sticks are dead bits of wood that you stick in the ground in order to get the exciting stuff happening. And I, without wishing to demean what we do as small group leaders, really, they're the structure, they're not the life. They're the bean stick, not the bean. The point is not to have a church which has fantastic bean sticks all lined up. We got, we got another, we got another of bean sticks this year. We got three more small groups. So what? The, the yardstick is not how many bean sticks you got, but what's the life of the bean like? How healthy are your disciples? So the the the, the, the question that we're asking here is what kind of structures? What happens? What kind of bean sticks do we need? in order to create and sustain and nurture the kind of life I was talking about before the break. What needs to be happening in our small groups? And I'll say again that I'm, I'm not really here today to point you towards particular resources or programs. There's heaps of wonderful stuff. I will mention some things at some point during the day I just laid out here. Incidentally, these are my books on the table. Please do not take them away. <laughs> Or if you do take them away, at least tell me which ones have gone so I can replace them when I get home. But, uh, so don't, don't, these are not for sale, but I did bring them and I'll mention them as, as we go a little bit. 
um, and some resources. But, but whatever resource we use, what I'm trying to do today is to encourage you to adopt a certain mindset as a small group leader, a certain ethos, a certain heart. Because I think if, if, if we think of our role in a certain way, and if we look for certain things happening in our groups, whatever resources we're using, they will become bent towards making disciples and make a difference in the world. So it so much rests on our own mindset and heart as leaders. So, bean stick and bean. There's no life without structure. The question is, how might we imagine small group structures that make disciples and cultivate missional life in our churches? And I want to go back to those words that I had on the screen beforehand. I haven't moved on from them. I'm still dwelling with those from Matthew 28. Here's some questions that might help us evaluate the small groups that we're in. Does this group help me discover and grow in my new identity as a disciple of Jesus? Does this group help me deepen my relationship with God, Father, Son, and Spirit? Does this group help me discover and live out my part in God's purposes? And does this group help me obediently live the Jesus life? Now, you've seen what I've done there. I've just taken those markers from Matthew 28 and form them into questions that help us to evaluate. If we're really trying to, if that's what a disciple is, and of course you can decide otherwise, but for today that's what I'm working with. If that's what a disciple is, defined by Jesus at the end of Matthew's Gospel, and if our groups are about making those kinds of people and helping one another become those kinds of people, then the evaluative questions must be something that looks like that wouldn't be a bad thing of discussing with our groups if we want to work out how, how on track we are or how on track we're not, to actually say, well, let's talk about it. So I went on this day on Saturday. It was, it was all right. But th these questions are really interesting. Um, I'd, I'd be really interested to know, as leader of your group, what you think about these. Is, is, is this group helping you do this or not? It's a place to start because I'm aware that most of us are not starting from scratch. It's always easier to start from scratch. And if I was starting from scratch... I would pin this up and say, we've got small groups in this church. This is what they're about. This is what we're going to help you do. This is how we're going to, you know. But a lot of us, we're starting with groups of people who are more like the Women's Institute or Plants in a Greenhouse or whatever. And so this is going to come as a bit of a shock to them when, when we suddenly start thinking like this as, as leaders. So the challenge is then, how do we begin? Well, one way to begin is just by painting the picture in our own language in a way that they can understand and just discussing this and saying, well, what would this look like? Notice those things actually fall into sort of two categories, broadly speaking, generalising. The two at the top are about who we are and about the quality of our inner life. Who I know myself to be in Christ. How I know Christ in me. How do I deepen my relationship with God? Well, through using the spiritual practices like prayer and scripture, you know, the ancient practices of the church. Uh, they're about who I am and how I develop my inner life. The two at the bottom are more about what I do and my outer life. How do I think of my career or my club that I belong to as an ex that's the place where I go to be a disciple, not just the place I go to play tennis or the place I go to make money? How do I discover that my outer life is connected to my inner life? And does this group help me obediently live the Jesus life? That's obviously an outward-looking thing. And at, our, at, at um, root, our small group should be helping us address both of those. If all we talk about is what we're going to do, and we don't help one another access the resources to live the life, then we will be <coughs> impoverished. We have to live out of our inner selves. Jesus said, if you're thirsty for real life, come to me and drink, and out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That there's something that has to go in, in order for it to come out. Or, to use a different metaphor, uh, this, is, this is testing my sanctification. This is, uh, <laughs> and it's pretty thin, I warn you. So, um, <clears throat> I'll turn it off in a minute. The... Um, the, the, the challenge is our intimacy, our knowledge of God, our time we spend with God, our investment in spiritual practices, investing in our spiritual growth. Spiritual growth doesn't just happen. That's why you make disciples. <laughs>
You don't discover them. <laughs> There's something that we have to invest in as disciples and in helping other people. That intimacy with God, knowing him, meeting him, listening to his voice. Because then when we get out into the world, we might have a way of living differently. The two things are connected. And somehow in our small groups, we've got to be helping one another, both invest in our spiritual growth in order that we've got something to offer. Jesus did it all the time. He lived in this constant rhythm of withdrawal and engagement. Luke tells us in Luke 5, doesn't he? Jesus was always withdrawing to lonely places and praying. Really frustrating for his disciples. And yet that withdrawal is what shaped his engagement. He, it's really hard for us in the busy Western world where busyness is a benchmark for holiness. I'm really involved in my church. I do this, I do that. And I run the club and I run the children and I do it and my grandchildren. And, blah, 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 blah. and I'm doing it all for Jesus. Well, you might kid yourself. But that's not how Jesus lived. <laughs> Jesus was always withdrawing to lonely places because he knew that unless he was himself listening to his father, there's no way he could engage with life and say, I only say what I hear my father saying. Unless he was communing with his father, he couldn't engage every day and say, I only do what I see my father do. There is a vital connection between our spiritual life and our life lived out in the world. And many of us in our churches in the West are so activist, so activist, that we somehow think that we can do what Jesus never managed to do, which is never withdraw to the lonely places and pray, never mind frequently, and still somehow live the life. One of the questions I'm going to have on the screen later is, you know the WWJD, what would Jesus do? It's a good question, isn't it? What would Jesus do? It's a very helpful question. Uh, incidentally, do you know that there was a, a, a crusade in America a few years ago trying to hijack the WWJD thing, which was very sort of well-known in America, and, and it was the, it, the environmental lobby were trying to work out the best environmental car. So they did a thing, WWJD, what would Jesus drive? <laughs> and they had this big billboard campaign, what would Jesus drive? And a, and a website where you could send in uh, your suggestions. And they were quite shocked that, that they got the answer over and over again, a Honda. <laughs> so they, they did a bit of research and worked out why. And they discovered that a number of very clever people had worked out that in John's Gospel it says, Jesus said, I did not speak of my own accord. <laughs> <laughs> Implying that he clearly had one. Later, endorsed by the fact that it says Jesus and his disciples were all in one accord. <laughs> so, drive a Japanese car. <laughs> Closer to Jesus. Um, anyway, leaving all that on the side of the plate, I wish I hadn't started that. Uh, so, the WWJD question, rightly understood, only takes us so far. Because, in fact, if you've read your Bible a bit, it's not a hard question to answer. You're on, a steep, you're on a sea crossing, it cuts up a bit rough, you're not too sure what to do. Easy, stand up the front of the ferry and shout. <laughs> what would Jesus do? Yeah. That's what he does. Still the storm. <clears throat> or you've got a bunch of friends who've gone out fishing off Burnham and they're, you know, it's getting a bit choppy out there in the, in the, in the sea, or flat home or steep home or whatever it's called. And, and, and so you think, oh dear, I wish I'd gone with them. Well, I know what I could do. What would Jesus do? I'll walk out and, I, I'll walk out and help them. What would Jesus do only takes us so far? I know there is, there is some helpful stuff in there. I'm being a bit facetious, obviously. But the really important question is, and I can never do the acronym for this, how did Jesus do what Jesus did? How did Jesus prepare? An American writer called Dallas Willard, who died last year, but a fantastic writer on discipleship, he said, we will never do the things that Jesus did if we don't prepare in the way that Jesus prepared. <coughs> The disciples had that problem, didn't they? When the little boy who was demonized, the father said, my, my, my son's got this terrible fitting problem, he throws himself in the fire, and the disciples said, okay, we know what Jesus does. Nothing happens. Jesus comes along. The father says, you got a pretty rubbish bunch of them. They know nothing. So Jesus said, oh, how much longer have I got to put up with this bunch of thick heads? Okay. Delivers the boy, disciples later in private. Why couldn't we do that? Depending which gospel you read. But one of the answers is because this kind only comes out through prayer or prayer and fasting. 
In other words, there was something about the way that Jesus had prepared his life in prayer and fasting that had equipped him to do what needed to be done at the moment when he did it. The disciples thought they could just do it, apparently, without the backup of the kind of prayer and fasting that Jesus gave himself to. It's no good trying to do what Jesus does if we're not also preparing as Jesus prepared, to use Dallas Willard's phrase. And so the challenge in our small groups is not always to keep a balance between those two things, both helping one another grow in spirit. How do we do that? Well, the, the ancients of the church understood all too well what Jesus understood, that there are particular ways that God has said he will refresh our souls. He will meet with us. He will speak with us. What we call spiritual disciplines. John Wesley had a nicer phrase. I like John Wesley's phrase. The means of grace. The means of grace. The means by which God imparts his grace. Scripture. Prayer. Fasting. Bread and wine. Fellowship. You can go down the list. You can whichever book you want to read on spiritual disciplines or means of grace. There's lots of them. But somehow, in our small groups, we need to be helping one another engage with those spiritual practices. There's no good sitting around every week thinking about, right, what are we going to do this week? Because we can never be the kind of disciple that I was describing earlier unless we actually prepare as Jesus taught his disciples to prepare. You know, you put up with the fact that they blew it a lot of the time. That's the encouraging thing about the disciples, isn't it, right? It'd be terrible if they were supermen. The great thing about the disciples is how often they blow it. So, we need small groups where these kind of things begin to happen. <sighs> yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll tell you what, talk about that for two minutes. <laughs> it's a strategic break. And I'll sort out the, the, the demon that's got inside my Mac. Uh, and if you just want to just talk about what you just heard, that connection between outer life and inner life and the importance of small groups to making disciples and so on, for two minutes and I'll be back with you. All debugged. No. No, it's, it's um, for some reason, I imported some slides from another presentation and they must have been there must have been a timer on so no. I think my presentation bridge picture that I put up from a friend of mine who's an Anglican vicar and he had set it to progress automatically and I hadn't spotted that and all the other slides picked up his Anglicanism <laughs> and decided they would progress in an Anglican fashion <laughs> without being told what to do. So I think I've, I've put a bit of Methodism back into the system and it's now highly controlled and organised. <laughs> How to lose friends. I work, I work for the Methodist Church for five years, so I, 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 I do knock it as an insider, a half insider, but anyway, I don't knock it at all. Um, five dynamics, moving on quickly before I... Five dynamics of mission, disciple-making groups. I want to suggest, uh, th th these, these are not rocket science, okay, but, but I think these are some of the strands, the ethos that we want if we're going to actually make disciples, help one another become disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, in one sense, they're fairly basic. You, you heard the story about the, uh, the, the sea captain, the, sea -going, the captain of a seagoing ship, who, before his ship left port, every time, before they undocked, he would go to a little drawer on the uh, bridge of the ship, unlock the drawer with a little key kept in his pocket, unroll a little piece of paper, read what was on the paper, put it back in the drawer, lock the drawer, and then start the procedures for leaving port. And over time, the men who shared the bridge with him wondered what on earth that was all about. What was on the paper? And they began to wonder and they conversed. And, you know, was it a picture of his wife? Was it a, a, a last will and testament? You know, uh, was it a stirring poem that inspired his leadership? And eventually, one day, they could bear it no longer. And when he wasn't on the bridge, they nicked the key and they opened the drawer and unrolled the paper to see what was so important. And it said, 
port left, starboard right. <laughs> so, what I'm about to show you is a little bit port left, starboard right. Okay, so it's not, it's not rocket science. It, it may be stuff you come across. So, uh, but nevertheless. If you forget which is which, you are clearly in trouble. So, so the, 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 these may be basic, but they're important basics. The first is these. That within our groups, we need both to have as leaders and to encourage others to understand that we are here to grow to be more like Jesus. There needs to be a clear intention. As I said earlier, discipleship doesn't just happen through sitting in meetings and disciples don't just appear they're made. The invitation is to join this intentional journey towards Christ-likeness. And somehow we need to be unashamed of saying the stakes are quite high here. I heard some of you earlier, I just eavesdropped a little bit, after that first session when I put up my definition of what a disciple is, and a couple of people said, Phew, that's odd. <laughs> yes, it is. It costs you everything. It costs you your life. Jesus, when people said similar things around him, large crowds were travelling with him, here's the crowds, and he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. And you know the hate thing means love more than and all of that, so Jesus wasn't literally calling us to hate. But he said, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This is an all or nothing thing. This isn't a bit of spirituality tacked on the side of your week or a, a social club tacked on the side. This is you, who you are and who you want to become and how you want to live and who you want to serve and which master you're really living under. This is an all or nothing live or die venture. And if you're not up for it, then we will run a group for people that want a knit and natter. We'll run a group for people that want to play ping pong. But actually, there's a bunch of us here who really intentionally want to become more like Jesus because we understand for us that's the most fulfilling thing to be and for the world it's the best hope we can offer. So we may want to think about who's in our group. We may want to think of if we're leaders about how we format our groups. But I want to say if you want to make disciples, you've got to have people who are intending to be disciples. Because otherwise they'll keep derailing the process. Of course we're going to provide for all kinds of people at all kinds of stages and people at very different stages on that journey. But is that the journey you're on? Is the question. Do we really want to know Jesus? I'm struck by the Apostle Paul um, writing to the Philippians. This is from his Facebook page, so it's definitely him. Um, uh, <coughs> the Apostle Paul at the end of, or we believe, towards the end of his life, writing from a prison cell, knowing he didn't have much ministry left, writing to a church to encourage them, what would you have written? Well, one possibility is you might have written really encouraging stories about what God had done. That you, you, you wanted to tell them about all the churches that had been planted, about all the miracles that you'd seen, the people you'd seen come to faith, the wonderful opportunities you had to share gospel, the fantastic deliverance that you'd experienced. You may want to recount the past. But what Paul says is this, is, this is my ambition. This is how I want to encourage you. I want to say that all my past, my past in, in Judaism and so on, is, is rubbish. Here's the really worthwhile thing. Knowing Jesus Christ, for whose sake I've lost all things. And he says at the end of his life, when he knew he didn't have much time left, I want to know Christ. I'm pressing on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ has taken hold of me. That's my ambition as a person. It's stirring. I hope when I'm... At the end of my life, whenever that is, it feels like I'm quite close at the moment, but whenever that is, I hope that I'm still hungry and passionate. You know that idea of hunger and thirst is right throughout scripture as the marker of a disciple. Disciples, by definition, are learners. Therefore, they're not people who've got it all, who understand it all, who can do it all. They're people who are committed to a journey of learning. They're hungry and thirsty for something that they do not yet have. Psalm 63 was deemed to be so important by the early church fathers that it was said they should read it every day. Oh God, you are my God. What wonderful confidence. And I long for you. What wonderful hunger. And somehow if we can hold together that confidence and that hunger together so that we're not desperate by, because of the hunger, um, but nor are we so confident that we think there's no, no growth left. There's nowhere left to go. We need people who are intentional. That's the first thing in our small groups. It's the first strand. 
And somehow as leaders, we've got to address these challenges to ourselves. Am I hungry for Christ? Am I intentional about being a disciple? Because there is a, th- a, a, a motto around leadership that says we only reproduce what we are. Which is a challenge. The second theme is the theme of expectancy. <clears throat> when we meet together, Jesus is here. Have you ever been one of those, um, ex- had one of those experiences where people don't know you're in the room and they're talking about you? Maybe you haven't. Looking around, no nods, smiles, all grunts at that stage. So they, but, but I've had that experience a couple of times, really, where you're in a crowd of people and you hear people talking about David and you think, yeah, well, I'm here. You could talk to me. You could ask me. I'm actually in the room, okay? You don't have to talk about me. You could talk to me. Not that they were saying anything negative, but uh, it, it was just a bizarre experience. You know, I was in the room, but like everyone was talking as though other people would know me better than I know myself. And I think sometimes in our church meetings, whether they're small groups or others, sometimes there's a tendency to talk about Jesus as though he wasn't in the room. To talk about Jesus as though he wasn't in the room. And surely one of the great, if not the great promise of coming to faith is that we know the presence of God personally and corporately, where even two or three gather together. I'm there in the midst, Jesus said. And I think the, um, the, 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 the challenge of this strand is, is how do we do that? Well, it can be very simple. It can just be, at the beginning of our meetings, pausing. Give people ten minutes to to do the Women's Institute thing. And then say, okay, we're going to start the meeting. And we're going to start by reminding people, remind us all that Jesus is in the room. And then whether you sit in silence or light a candle or listen to a song or whatever you do, whatever's your thing there. But, But just remind us that Jesus is in the room. And to remind ourselves that Jesus is in the room by being in each other. I'm going to come to that in a minute. Expecting, in other words, that Jesus will work through me into your life and through your life into me. That this isn't just a human interaction. This is a divine encounter. God's here and he might want to speak. God's here and he might want to heal. God's here and he might want to challenge. God's here and he might want to direct. And one of the problems with with Bible study is that sometimes it can get stuck at the kind of the discussion level but the Bible is one of Wesley's means of grace have you ever read Wesley's Methodists you'll know this you'll read it every night before you go to bed his, his sermon on the means of grace if you haven't read Wesley's sermon on the means of grace you should, should well I say you should this is another category that my wife and I disagree on I think it's really really interesting she wouldn't have touched it with a barge pole but, but, but Wesley makes the point that means are not ends Don't think that the point of reading the Bible is to read the Bible. Don't think that the point of reading the Bible is to understand the Bible. The point of reading and studying the Bible is to hear God's voice. Don't think that praying is the point of praying. Praying is about a real communion and a communication with God who may want to speak back. It's a means of grace. It's not an end of grace. And so in our groups, we need to kind of, different ways as leaders, keep working away at this idea that that Jesus is actually here. Jesus is around. One of the things that that does is it prepares us for some of the practices that we need when we live in the world. See, our effectiveness as a missionary in our offices and shops and wherever God kind of suddenly surprises us by his presence is, is about being able to listen to his voice. When I met this person, I had this real strange sense. I just felt God wanted me to... Have you ever had that? Heard people say that? Or maybe had that yourself? That prompting of the spirit that happens. And you think, actually, I just need to go and give that person something. Or, or I need to go and sit with that person. Learning to listen to his voice. Learning to trust his leading. Learning to tell our story. You know, many of us struggle with our story of faith in everyday life. So a small group is a great place to practice that. (laughs) To hear ourselves talk about our own faith for the first time, perhaps. Learning to pray. I think prayer is a great evangelistic tool. 
Because far more people believe in prayer than believe in God, bizarrely. I don't know what the percentage is. You know, there's, there's about 92% of people say they pray, about 77% believe, believe in God or something like that. There's a, there's a dissonance. So you think, well, what's going on in the, with the people in the middle there? But I, I, I'm sure you can tell your own stories. But, you know, lovely stories of, of, of a friend of mine who worked at an office down in Bristol and uh, she was going home one day and the receptionist who worked on the, on the desk in, in, in the foyer of this business uh, was, was, was weeping and uh, my friend sort of just felt she should go and talk to her uh, and went and talked to her and you know, the story developed. And out of the blue, my friend heard herself saying, would you like me to pray with you? And uh, the woman sort of looked a bit shocked because no one had ever offered that before. And she said, yeah, I think I would. So, so there and there, in a workplace, they, they just had a little prayer together. And that opened up a conversation that then played forward into the rest of the week. And, and, and I'd love to tell it's a glorious story. That woman came to faith. I don't know if that's the end of the story. But she certainly began to explore faith just because someone said, would you like me to pray with you about that? Now, where do you learn? See, I, I know many Christians of quite senior vintage still who actually don't pray out loud in church. Well, where are you going to learn to do that? <laughs> Small groups are a perfect place to do that, to learn the practices that we need in mission by learning them in our small groups, to expect that Jesus is here, learning what it means to serve one another so that we can transpose that serving out into the wider field of relationships that we're in every day. So the second strand is this strand of expectancy. This is a spiritual encounter. It's not just, just, I say, a Bible study or a discussion group. Third strand, which I've hinted at already, is that there needs to be, in our groups, a deep integration between the lives that people are leading outside of the group and the lives that they participate in when they come into the group. This... You may or may not be able to identify with some of my illustrations, but I've known small groups where you almost have to leave your life at the door because there's a program and we've got a lot to get through tonight and there's a study on Ezekiel. I don't know why I keep being on Ezekiel. I love the book of Ezekiel. It's fantastic. That picture of the temple and the river of God, fantastic. Anyway, uh, but, but the program can sometimes dominate people's real lives. And what a small group should be, as it was with the disciples, we'll come back to this later again, is that connecting place where my experience of life and your help in discerning and weighing that in the presence of God come together. This is a place where I can talk about what it's like for me at work at the moment because I need you to help me discover how on earth I can live for God there. I'm struggling at the moment. It's not really working. One of the problems is, the women, back to the Women's Institute again, is that when the conversation sticks at that surface level of just describing events, this happened this week, and this person said this, and my children did this, and my grandchildren did this, and you're kind of hovering over the event. What, as group leaders, we need to learn to do is to help people integrate that event with what God is about in their life at the moment. So what would God want you to do with that? How would God want you to handle that? WWJD. <laughs> what, what's going on there? So, so one of the challenges, one of the questions that we might want to learn to ask as group leaders is, is that kind of integrating question. Honouring and valuing the life that people live outside of the group and saying this group is a, is a, is a bit like a, you know, it's a, it's a place where we spring into and then spring out of. It's a, it's a place we rebound into and rebound out of. It's a, it's a means of grace to us. Church happens all over the place. If church is simply the plural of the word disciple, then wherever disciple is, there is church. The people of God dispersed and scattered. So church through the week is all over the place. But where can I process these experiences, these challenges, these opportunities? I can't do that on a sun in a Sunday gathering of 50, 100, 150, whatever people. Because there's just too many stories in the room. <laughs> you know, you don't have time on a Sunday, do you? You, you, you know, you, I know why you don't have time on a Sunday. Let me guess, because you're on a rotor. <laughs> you know, there are, there are two ways that you know you're a real Christian. One is that you're fine. 
And two is that you're on a rotor in a church somewhere. <laughs> and if you're always fine and on a rotor, you're almost certainly amongst the saved. Um, but Sunday morning is a very pressurised environment. There is a lot to do. And, and, you know, if you've got kids around and there's, there's this to do and there's flowers to put up and, you know, whatever. And you've got to get through it in time to go home and watch the rugby as well. So it's a really pressurised environment. If people in our churches are really going to understand what it means to be a disciple in everyday life, they need a space where their everyday lives can be surfaced and explored, not in a kind of a gossip or just a tittle tattle, but, but in, a, in a discerning way. So what is God up to in giving you that opportunity? That's a good question. It's really hard in my office, everybody hates it. So why would God put you there? That suddenly takes the conversation to a new level. <clears throat> so we want to find ways within our groups, and even when we're doing Bible study, to ask these integrating questions. So we might start with life and allow our experience of Scripture and prayer to examine our life. Or we might start with Scripture and prayer, and we might then say, OK, so what difference does this make in, out there? But always we're trying to join up the two. Integrating life and group, which, as we'll see later, is how Jesus did it. Fourth strand, fourth group dynamic, is that we need our groups to be places of high on honesty. That's quite hard to say, actually. It wasn't hard to write. High honesty. Not high honesty or I honesty. High honesty. Um, again, this, uh, this may not be your experience, but... but, but I know, personally, let me share personally, I know how easy it is to hide significant bits of my life from people at church. In fact, people expect me to do that as the minister. They don't want me to stand up on a Sunday and confess everything <coughs> and, and so on because they'd feel very disappointed if they realised I was just as much a mess as they are. They need the myth of my, the myth of my perfection. Um, actually, it's not true. Well, it's partly true. Um, because generally, when people realise you're just the same as everybody else, they look for a new minister. So, um, <coughs> but the, ain't that the truth, though, that actually we're all just disciples together. Whether we stand on a platform and we've got a microphone or not, we're all just learners in this game. Some of us may be more advanced learners, but we're all just learners. So I need a place, a group of friends, who know me well enough and who I trust enough that I am willing to be transparent and who know me. Because I can't do it to 200 people on a Sunday morning. And I won't do it there. It's inappropriate to do it there. It's not helpful for me or for them to do it there. But if I haven't got a place where I can be fully known and realise that I'm loved anyway, then I'm sunk. And one of the gifts of a small group is that it can become that place of deep trust and transparency. Because those two things don't grow easily in large groups. Trust and transparency, those two things. <clears throat> and they're connected, obviously. So I need places that are safe places, where I can say what I want to say about who I am at the moment and where I am with God at the moment and what I'm struggling with at the moment and what I wish wasn't in my life but is in my life at the moment and so on and so forth. Because if I can't, I just live in some sort of unreality. And I know so many people in ministry who've actually left ministry or cracked up simply because they can't live with that unreality any longer. They can't just keep pretending because they know deep down that's what they're doing. So I need a place where I'm not pretending. So I've got a small group of five um, fellow ministers, actually, not all from my church. They're all from different sorts of churches. We've been meeting now for about four years. We meet once a month uh, for a morning. And basically, we take it in turns and we answer that old Wesleyan question, how is it with your soul? And we know each other well enough and trust each other well enough <coughs> to bear all. And there's been quite a lot of tears over the years and laughter and um, pizza. Um, <coughs> but that, I, and each of these men that I'm in, in this group with, between us there's about like 3,000 years Christian ministry experience because we're all really old. Right, so, so we've, been, we've been at it for a long time. But each of us would say, I wish I'd found this when I was a younger person. Now, interestingly, what happened was, out of this small group that we're part of, one of the guys, his name's Steve, he's a URC minister, 
but he's trying to get over that. He's, he's a URC minister. No, he is, seriously. I don't, that, that was his angle, not mine. Um, he, he went back to his church, and he talk, he's got an eldership, 12 people. How biblical is that? He had 12 people. And he started talking about our group and what the relationships were like in the group, not sharing confidences, but just the dynamics of how the group worked. And, and they said, well, why can't we have groups like that? So he said, well, you can. It's not a secret. You know, it's not a secret society. So he set up with his 12, three fours, and uh, they started meeting. And then people in the church got to hear, and they said, hey, this sounds really good. How come, how come it's just the elders? Why can't we be in groups like that? So he said, well, it's not. You know, anyone can be in a group. So they've now got, I think they've got about 19 of these small groups set up as places where people can grow as disciples, knowing that if we're not transparent, we're blocked and stuck. When can you help me change? You can only help me change when you know what's really going on in my life. If you're only responding to some delusion that I'm pitching in your direction, you can just, if I'm fine all the time, you can just say, that's nice, we've got a wonderful ministry, he's fine all the time. But if you were the kind of person that I was in a relationship with and you knew where I was incredibly stuck or incredibly hurting or incredibly fragile at the moment or frustrated, then you could actually begin to help me because you know me. Until we take, until we're in the kinds of relationships where we're willing to take off the masks, we will be stuck. We might want to look at our groups, our small groups, and say, oh, to what degree is that happening? To what degree is it possible? See, this particular dynamic only works in really quite small groups. I think some of our small groups are actually small churches. I talk to small group leaders sometimes, they say, well, we've got 15 people in our small group. I say, that's not a small group, that's half a congregation. <laughs> the optimum number is supposed to be eight people. Small group theorists, whoever they are, I've never met one, but I've read some of their books, say that the optimum number for interaction so on is eight people. I want to say for this kind of interaction, even maybe eight people is too, too many. And it may be that within our larger groups, we want to find times and ways of meeting as subgroups, as slightly smaller groups, to achieve some of the things that we need to do to make disciples. Something to think about. I'll come back to that thought later, maybe. The fifth of my, uh, whatever they are, dynamics, is the dynamic of mutual accountability. People are frightened of that word accountability because it sounds like interrogation. Or, you know, if I'm accountable to you, then it means you're going to come and ask me all sorts of questions that I don't want to answer. That's not what I mean by a a accountability. What I mean by accountability is that someone who I can give an honest account to about what I'm doing in my life with God. Someone who I can give an honest account to. And who will help me stay true to my own good intentions. Have you ever been in that sort of situation? It's, it's January, so I suspect we've all just signed up for a gym or something. You know, or, uh, We're sitting in front of a plate of chocolate biscuits and we're wondering, should I, shouldn't I? Um, the, the challenge is not, again, knowing what I want to do. I want to eat the fruit. Actually, it's not true. I want to eat the cake. But, but, but uh, um, imagine that I was a bizarre person who preferred fruit to cake. Um, uh, I, I know that's good for me. I know I should eat five fruits a day. Does anyone, does anyone do that? Is it really possible to do that? Well done. So well done. You're okay. It's an annual requirement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. 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 I, I believe in this. It's like my son who calls himself a non-practicing vegetarian. Um, <laughs> it's kind of good for his, his, his conscience that he's a vegetarian, but it actually means he can eat what he wants. So um, anyway, how do I get on to all that? Yeah, so... So what I need are people who can hold me true to my own good intentions. Because here's what often happens in our small groups. We sit around, we talk about some stuff, and we say, yeah, wouldn't it be lovely if I prayed more? Wouldn't it be lovely if I did this? Wouldn't it be lovely if I invited my neighbour around for coffee? I've got some good intentions. I really want to be a disciple. Wouldn't it be lovely if actually I gave a little bit more money to the poor? Wouldn't it be lovely? And then next week we come in, on the programme this week, we've done Ezekiel, we're on to Romans now. <laughs> No one ever asks me if I gave the money to the poor or I invited my neighbour around or what I've done with my intention to pray. No one is helping me stay true to my own good intentions. And so my own good intentions, like the January diet and gym membership, fade away. Or like reading through the Bible in a year. How many of you have got to Leviticus and just given up late February, you know? It's, 
You, you need somebody else to help you stay true to your own good intentions. I need that. We all need that. So in our church small groups, we encourage every small group session to end with just asking these questions. We produce small group notes each week based on the sermon. And at the end of the notes that we produce, we always put this paragraph. Don't forget, small group leaders, finally, my brethren, before you conclude, ask each person, go around the room, what's the main thing you're taking away as an action point from tonight? Don't let anyone off the hook. This is their growth point. Don't tell them what to do. Ask them to choose what to do. It's their good intention. But what do you want to do? It may be a big thing. It may be a small thing. Secondly, so how can we pray for you through the week? And thirdly, is there anything we can check on next time we meet? What that does is it, it builds in this notion of accountability. You're interested in what I'm going to go away and do. You're going to pray for me and Crikey, you're going to ask me next week whether I've done it? <laughs> maybe, maybe, I don't want to be embarrassed when you ask me. Maybe I ought to actually do what I... Or maybe I ought to adjust my intentions <laughs> and stop talking off the top of my hat some, all the time. You know, maybe I'm getting up at five o'clock to pray every morning. I shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> because you're going to ask me if I did it. But we need groups that, 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 that do that for us, that actually don't just discuss or come up with general ideas or deeper knowledge, but actually hold us to account for our intention to grow as a disciple. So those five things, I would suggest, are core dynamics for a disciple-making group. I think that what Jesus did with his disciples, he called them to a clear intention, do you mean this or not? He taught them to believe that if he was there, things would change. There's an expectancy about the disciples. There was a deep integration in Jesus' own life and in the disciples. They were always sending them out, come back, let's talk about it. There was high honesty. Sometimes Jesus was more honest with them than they were with him, but there was high honesty. And there was certainly mutual accountability built in. Um, so I want to suggest that whatever we do, whatever program we do, whatever resource we pick up, somehow or other, those are five dynamics that need to be present in our groups if we want to be serious about making disciples. Now, time has run away and it's lunchtime, so what we'll do is we'll pick up the threads after lunch and, and have the conversation that we might have had now, uh, because I don't want to frustrate the people that have been working hard on our behalf to, to cook. So Phil's going to introduce this most important part of the day. <laughs> we brought in the best speaker to introduce lunch.